issues. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Johnny Amari. I, I'm running also for place one in probate court, but I am fortunate enough to not have a primary opponent, so I get to watch these fine ladies and gentlemen battle it, battle it out March 5th, and uh, I get to just sit back and relax. But uh, I've been a lawyer for 15 years. Um, I'm married. I have four children. My family, we live, we live in Trustful. Um, you know, I grew up with a family that was committed to public service. And that's my main reason for wanting to run is, is I'm a big believer in the community coming together and choosing the person they want to represent them, the person that they believe exudes fairness and uh, is, is going to be the most qualified judge. And, and it's one of my greatest privileges to talk to people, especially people that care enough <clears throat> about their community and who their elected officials are to come to a place like this at 630 on a Thursday night because I'm sure we could all find something else to do tonight, but y'all being here shows how much you care. So I want to thank y'all for, for having me. Good afternoon. I am attorney Joy Travis. I'm asking that you trust in Travis on March 5th. Please put Joy in probate court. Um, I am an attorney that has been dealing with family uh, issues. I have been working with family court, um, criminal court, and probate court um, since I passed the bar in 2017. I have my own practice, it's called Travis Law, and I have been a public servant in working in these spaces to engage people of all different backgrounds for over 20 years. Um, I am passionate about people, and I am passionate about engaging folks, so I want our courts to be ethical, efficient, and engaging. So please don't, don't forget me on March 5th, trust in Travis. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Lee Loader, and I want to be your probate judge. Let me tell you why. There are at least three reasons why I'm in this race, and a lot of people ask because I've had a past uh, opportunity to be in elected office. The most important for me is my passion for mental health. I've been serving in the last six years in the Birmingham, uh, as a Birmingham municipal judge, and primarily at the Birmingham jail. And I have watched how the jail, the Birmingham jail, has become the primary mental health provider in the city of Birmingham. And the reason that's the case, because about in 1970 or 80, they had this concept called super predators. And that was basically the gangsters in California and everything. And somebody said, we need to take young people, and instead of giving them mental health care, we need to put them in jail. So they took all the money, and they took it out of health care, mental health institutions closed down, Cooper Green closed down, and the jails began expanding. One of the reasons I want to be involved is because probate court has oversight over mental health commitments. And even though I may not be the judge over that particular area, I want to be a voice for all of our cousins and our nephews and our nieces and our aunties and our uncles who have dealt with mental health problems. I want to be a lead voice in making sure that Birmingham has the best health care for mental health in this city, in this region, and in this state. I'm Lee Loader, and I want to be your probate judge. Okay, next. Hello, everybody. I am attorney Yeshiva Red Blanchard, and I am a candidate for probate judge place one. I am a native of Birmingham, Alabama. I'm a wife, I'm a mother, I'm a grandmother. I'm a 10-year practicing lawyer. I champion veterans' rights and also probate court. I have experience in probate court regarding to adoptions, um, the opening of estates, um, the probation of wills. Um, I've done those things. I'm allowed to sit currently as a special district court judge and a special circuit court judge for judges when they're off the bench. They entrust me with their dockets to make decisions. I'm very active in my church. I'm a trustee at Sixth Avenue Baptist Church. I am also a proud member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. I have the qualifications. I have bench trial experience. I have jury trial experience. There's three things I want to do on the bench. I want to improve efficiency. I want to make sure that there's voters' education and voters' awareness. And I want to advocate for fair voting processes. And so I'm asking you on March 5th, when you go to the polls, to bet on Blanchard. Thank you so much. Good evening. My name is Everett West. 
and I'm running for Jefferson County Probate Judge, place one. I started practicing specifically in the area of probate law back in 2000 when Judge Reynolds was on the bench. Uh, I used to work a number of involuntary commitment cases as the guardian ad litem and as an advocate. Uh, I've continue, continued to work in probate law uh, throughout the administration of Judge Bowen. They were presiding judges, uh, Judge Gaines, uh, Judge King, uh, and Judge Nafta. So I worked through a number of administrations uh, in probate judge, in probate uh, court. Um, I have uh, probated many estates. I lost my own mother and father. So I understand the importance of having someone who has the right temperament and the compassion for dealing with families who are dealing with lost ones who have to divide their assets. I have that understanding. I have that experience more than 23 years. I've been a judge uh, for the city of Midfield over six years, uh, and I don't think you heard anything bad about what's going on in Midfield. That lets you know that I've been doing a good job. <laughs> when there's a problem, they complain about the judges. But I'm Everett West on March 5th. Vote yes for Everett West and be blessed. Thank you so much. Good evening. I am Jamiria Johnson Moore. I am running for judge of probate place two. I am currently serving as a city of Birmingham municipal judge. I have been doing that for over five years. I work in the probate court. I passed the bar in 2006 and I filed my first probate court case in October of 2006. I try cases in probate court. Probate is your family court. I know everybody says, hey, we're going to family court for child support and everything else. But if you want to see family, go to probate court. We want to keep families together. In probate court, over 600,000 people come in that court each year. When they come in that court, you want to have a judge that has excellent temperament with individuals. You want a judge that listens. You want a judge that don't see color. You want a judge that's going to rule pursuant to the law. That's what I promise you that I will do. I am not, I don't have any opposition in the Democratic Party, so I am happy to say tonight, I am the Democratic nominee for a Jefferson County judge in probate place two. I will not be on your ballot March 5th. However, I will be on the ballot in November, and I need your vote and your support. So thank you so much for allowing us to be here tonight, and I'm looking forward to answering additional questions. Hello, everyone. My name is Joel Blankenship, and I will be on the ballot against Jamiria in the fall. <laughs> so uh, I am the Republican nominee, and if you saw me shout her, I didn't know if I could say that word here in this, in this area, but no. Um, thank you so much for having me, first and foremost. I think it's absolutely wonderful that this many people want to get out and not only learn about candidates, but learn about candidates in a court that is as important as the probate court. As, as these lawyers have all said, what most of you don't realize is that all lawyers know this is the most important court uh, within our judicial system. This is the court that really administers the policies that helps things run in the county. Uh, you know, for throughout history, the probate judge has traditionally been one of, one of the leaders of the county, and it's an incredibly important position to have. I'm honored to be running. I hope uh, I can answer some great questions tonight. Hopefully we can come back later and, and differentiate ourselves a little bit more because the most important thing in this race is that we elect the right people for this court that serves the people of Jefferson County. Uh, oh, I didn't even tell you, my apologies. I'm from Jefferson County. I was born in St. Vincent's and I was adopted in the probate court in 1984. So it gave me my opportunity. It gave me my opportunity to not only have a wonderful, caring family, but to become the man I am today, to become the attorney and submit myself for the opportunity to run for this position. Look forward to talking to all y'all to all y'all later and uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, this is nonpartisan, so we do have Democratic candidates and also Republican candidates, but it is nonpartisan. And, uh, and we appreciate you all coming here because that means it's very important. So again, we are going to get started.
uh, at least it's going to be our timekeeper. Uh, candidates, I'm going to try to keep you to a minute and a half, no more than two minutes, and I will have um, the timekeeper of record in front of you, uh, and when she says rap, it is a hard rap. <laughs> like the six o'clock news, it's a hard rap. <laughs> okay, here we go. Here's our first question, and again, I will defer to my left or right, and we'll give each one of you an opportunity to have question uh, to answer the question. Please be brief. You are our lawyers. You know what that means. Be brief. Understanding of probate law. In your view, what are the most challenging aspects of probate law, and how do you plan to address these challenges? Let's start on the end, Mr. Lover. Thank you. Um, Use your mic. I think one of the first challenges is um, is we got to have a probate court that doesn't nickel and dime you to death. <laughs> Our probate court, unfortunately, is one of the only courts where you don't pay all your court fees up front. And one of the worst things that can happen to anybody is not to know how much it's going to cost to probate mama's estate or daddy's estate and to keep getting the bill for $150 here and $150 there. I just had one and it wasn't really much money in the estate. Mama's house had a mortgage on it ended up getting foreclosed on, but the daughter who was trying to take care of her, her mother's affairs uh, had to put advance that money in those costs. So one of the challenges I think we have to do is create um, transparency in court costs. You need to be able to pay whatever you gotta pay up front and know that you're finished with courthouse court costs, similar to where it works in federal court and the way it works in state court. Thanks, Attorney Lower, Attorney Travis. <coughs> Thank you, Trustee Travis. I believe there are a few challenges of probate court, one of them being um, representation in probate court. I think that sometimes it's hard to find attorneys that can help you with your matter. So being able to um, identify where those attorneys might be for you to find them and get a counsel. I also think the lack of familiarity with probate court. I think a lot of families might not have any interaction with probate court until they have to. And I think that we could be a little bit more proactive with educating people because I think that's the other challenge. People are not as educated about probate court as they may be about another court. Um, so try to be able to provide resources or work with the community to get feedback about what makes sense and what people need to know. Um, I also think the lack of just support. Um, I know that there are opportunities for legal assistance or um, other types of support legally for different courts like evictions or um, even uh, family court. But there is a void there. So there are many opportunities for um, uh, there to be, um, I guess, uh, attorneys appointed. I just think there needs to be more education around what probate court is, what should happen, and, and before you get there, how to prepare for probate court or how to avoid it. Thank you. Attorney Amari. So I'd be speaking for a long time if I sat up here and told you the problems I see as a lawyer trying to help my clients in probate court. But what I see from the people's perspective is this. You've got a place that's a little bit cold, it's a little bit intimidating, and you come in and you might have a very simple thing. You may just have a, a loved one that had a car or a loved one that just owned a house or, or maybe you're just trying to get into a checking account you, and, and you can't get any help. The people just can't get help. Like, how do I just go get this car out of, out of my grandmother's name? And how do I get a tag for it? And how do I sell my house? What I would love to see the court do is train the, the workers to help people and try to keep people from having to hire an attorney. And I know these lawyers may not like hearing that, but you know what? You may not need an attorney to get a car out of your mom's name. You may not need an attorney to transfer a house. I would love to train the staff to where they can be more engaging with the people because at the end of the day, the judge works for the people and the people working there work for the people. It's our tax money. It's, it's us as citizenry that they work for. And I think we should train people to be able to want to help us and be qualified to help us. Judge McDonald. I mean, attorneys, they did great. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I hear my, my um, other um, 
guests here saying that things that they would like to change. Um, it, it speaks well about having someone, having people at the counter be able to help. But the lawyers in the room understand that ethically we cannot do that, right? Um, so the, it sounds good to the citizens, but it's, in reality it does not. One thing that can help citizens to know the access that they have to the court, to understand the process. People complain about probating the estates takes a long time, but what they don't know is it's required by law to remain open for at least six months. People don't understand that it's not the judge that's holding up your case, it is the law written by the legislators. And so we need to educate citizens about what the law requires, point and simple. The filing fees, I understand about the nickel and diamond, but I practice probate throughout the state of Alabama, and we have a great probate court here. And it's because of the filing systems that we have. It's electronic. Most counties do not have electronic, so that means you have to file that paperwork over the counter. That, it, that slows down the process, so we need the filing fees. So, yes, the price can be different, but that filing fee supports the county and supports the probate office. Thank you. Thank you. Attorney Blanchard. Thank you. I would say there are challenges in probate court. The ones that I've experienced is a lack of a pro se day for clients who are representing themselves. That's one um, topic that I think that's a challenge. And then also, um, unnecessary hearings. And so I start with unnecessary hearings. And some of the cases that I've had with probate court where I'm opening like small estates where you have to file certain pleadings, the hearings are not unnecessary. We go to court, we're in court like two minutes and you get an order. That's something that a judge can do to be more efficient with their dockets. If you know that the attorney has filed all the pleadings that's needed for an order, you can eliminate unnecessary court hearings. And so I've had it where elderly clients have come into my office where they may be a widow, they had a husband and die, and we go to court for two minutes and we get an order when that order could have been shot out a couple of days after we submitted everything. Um, another thing I stated was a lack of pro se day. We all have clients that, are, that, are, that don't have money and they go to court and try to represent themselves. And so what I think we can do, what other courts do, because I am a uh, volunteer lawyer and I go in on pro se day and help clients that are, rep people that are representing themselves pro se without lawyers, help them with their cases without paying money. I think if we had a pro se day, we can get some of those dockets cleared as well because we'll have representation for pro se clients. Thank so thank you. The question is, Attorney West, in your view, what are the most challenging aspects of probate law and how do you plan to address these challenges? Probate is about families. When I passed the bar and saw what was going on in probate court, I said, Mom, Dad, do you have a will? They said, we got it, we got it. Families really don't understand probate. Mom died. Dad said, I can't do this, I can't do that. I said, Dad, you remember when I asked you and Mom to uh, get a last will and testament? He said, yes. I said, now you need to get one. And this is why you can't do what you want to do. And he got a last will and testament and uh, asked me to write it. I said, no, I'm your son. I have four siblings that I'm going to deal with. And uh, I don't, I don't want to be accused of anything. But he got his last will and testament and everything worked. He had everything in place in order to probate his estate. So it's about families having compassion understanding the, the dynamics of probating estates. I had to deal with my siblings uh, during the probation of my father's estate. And uh, so I have that experience. Uh, I have empathy for the people. And I can make sure that we treat people right in probate court. I think that's the most important thing. Uh, early on, when Judge Naffa took the bench, we had a fight in probate court because you had blended families. But I want to bring that compassion and try to defuse those types of situations. Thank you. Attorney Moore, you're running in probate place two. The people you just heard from were running in probate place one. Probate place two, I want to ask you that same question. In your view, what are the most challenging aspects of probate law? How do you plan to address these challenges? In probate place two. Thank you. Thank you for the question, the excellent question. 
want to first say that probate is extremely statutory. So the laws are written and we have to follow them. It is very time uh, constraints. There are a lot of number of days you have to wait, a number of various things you have to wait for. So I want to be very clear that my goal for probate court is that I want to make sure to hold attorneys accountable for getting into court and litigating their cases. We have to get attorneys into the court to be ready to litigate cases. That's number one. Number two, I work for the city of Birmingham in the jail. And it is true, that is a mental health jail. And my goal is, and one thing I want to do in the probate court that I would see is put a liaison in the jail from the probate court at least once or twice a month so that those individuals that need to have commitments filed, we can get those individuals on a list of expediently so that we can get them some help. The jail is not a place to help individuals. That's another thing that we really have to work on in probate court. And lastly, my third thing that I want, I want to do is mediation in probate court. We are families. Families are destroyed in dividing up mom and daddy stuff. If you haven't been there, just wait. We have to have mediators available in the probate court, a mediation day, so that we can help families to stay together. That is the way that we build our community, that is our, in our churches, that's how we build our country. So those are the three things that I would like to do. Attorney Blankenship, probate, place two. Uh, so I, I, I hate to start with agreeing with my opponent, but she's exactly right. It starts with mediation. It starts with people getting together and having discussions and, and remembering in probate matters where they get hotly contested over will. You know, I've said sometimes, unfortunately, a will is a divorce of a family and, and a lot of people fighting over property. So we need them to mediate and come to the agreement to preserve that family. Really, the biggest things, though, are education and communication. Education, educating the public, like this wonderful organization, on the importance of having a will and how much easier that probate process is versus an administration, versus two words that make me cringe, which is called air property, and clearing title to those things and doing everything expediently. And the second is communicating and communicating to the public. You know, the, the Jefferson County Probate Office by and far has the largest staff of any court within the Jefferson County system, probably close to in the state of Alabama. And that staff needs to be trained to communicate better with the public for the things that you don't need an attorney for. You do need an attorney for a will to probate an estate. We do need those attorneys. But if you're just recording an LLC, if you're recording a deed or a mortgage or something like that, or filing your marriage, I think it's a marriage contract right now. It's no longer a marriage license. But if you're just following that, we need people that can help instead of telling you to go to an attorney and explaining the process to you a lot better. Better communication, better education to the public is going to be the number one goals. Thank you. Our next question, your judicial philosophy and ethics. We're going to start with attorney Blankenship. And uh, probate two, we're going to go the reverse way. How would you describe your judicial philosophy, particularly in the context of the probate law, and or can you give an example of how you have dealt with ethical dilemmas in your legal career? You can take either one of those or combine them. I don't know that I can answer that in two minutes. I don't know that any attorney can answer that in two minutes. That's that's very complicated. Okay, so describe your judicial philosophy. Let's start with judicial philosophy. My judicial philosophy is very simple. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in the actual text of the document, and you have to go by the text. It cannot be a living interpretation. You have to go by the case law and the text of the statute. Uh, it's important that we do that. The state legislature has created the statute. Most of the time, with the advisement of the Alabama Law Institute, which is staffed by some of the brightest attorneys that we have. They create these statutes, they debate these statutes. The Alabama Law Institute works for years on doing these statutes and they choose the words for a reason and then the Supreme Court interprets these words for a reason. You need to get strictly to it. Uh, you know, one of my favorite examples is a couple of years ago there was a case in Bessemer in which they had begun selling tax properties inside the courthouse, not on the stairs of the courthouse. It has to be a literal, strict interpretation of the statute, the way that it's written. Judges are not up there to make up law. We're there to enforce and interpret the law in the best way that it's written. I'm 
gonna stop you right there. Um, so I told you I couldn't do it two turn, minutes. But you did. It's, it's a lie. More. That's a lie. Okay. <laughs> All right. That's a lie for this. I like it. I thank you for 20 years I've been through and have tried cases <laughs> in every county in the state. So let me just say this. My judicial philosophy is to listen to every individual that comes into the courtroom. I listen to the evidence that's presented in the court. I will rule by the law. That's why we have it. I will rule by the law. And I'm going to treat people with respect. That is utmost importance. Most of the time, people will never come into court for anything else other than possibly recording or seeing having a death or doing a conservatorship for a parent that can no longer uh, manage their, their affairs. And when you're going through that, you want someone that's going to listen to you. Sometimes you might listen to something that just might not even have a factor on how you rule, but you have to be able to listen and respect those individuals. That's my judicial philosophy. Now, I think the next part of the question was. You can pass it off. Oh, I think. Oh, just. Oh, okay. Well, that's just my judicial I'm philosophy. I'm pretty rich in all I, I guess. Yeah, that's okay. Your turn, Wes. <laughs> Thank you. For the last six years, I've been the judge for the city of Midfield. And I already listened to both sides. Uh, and that is the judicial philosophy that I will bring as your probate cook court judge. Uh, one of the one greatest compliments I received, I met a lady on the street, she said, we had a trial in your case, Judge Wentz, and you found me guilty. <laughs> but you were fair and you were nice. And on the inside, I said, Yes, that's what I want. That's what I want to do. That's how I want people to perceive me. And I'm, I'm telling you here today that that's what I want. And I want to be perceived as fair, but follow the law. So uh, that's my judicial philosophy. philosophy. Uh, Thank Attorney you. Blanchard? Okay, my judicial philosophy is when I sat on the bench as a special district court judge, special circuit court judge, I always made it a habit to first meet the litigants where they were, no matter where they came from, who they were. Um, listen, absolutely, you got to. Um, look at the facts, look at what I'm, what I'm, you know, what's before me, and make a fair decision. Um, of course, probate is statutory, so you do have to abide by the statute. And so that's something that I will do as your next probate judge, Jefferson County Place One. Um, I think a lot of times we take the human part out of being judges. And a lot of times what I've done in the past is I put myself in these litigants' position and had compassion for them and empathy for them and I made really, really fair rulings. And so, seconds. I'm done. <laughs> Thank you, I'm done. Uh, Attorney McDonald, probate place one. My accountability um, would be my philosophy. I'm going to show up prepared. As an attorney, it's very important, and you find delight when your judge is before you and they have read the information. You want somebody that's ready to hear your issues and be able to rule. So I'm going to be accountable and I'm going to serve. I'm not coming for accolades, I'm coming to work. I've been working hard, having my head down working, and I will continue to do that. I'm going to take that to the bench. I'm going to work hard and be accountable to you. I'm, I want to be able to be accessible to the public and to the parties, but you need a judge that is informed and is ready to work, and that's my philosophy. Thank you. Uh, Attorney Amari, probate one. That was a great answer. I hate having to follow that. Um, you know, when I think of just who I think of as, as the best judges, um, and, and thinking from a full of philosophical stance, it's usually the ones with the right temperament. And I heard somebody here tonight say that word. Some of the best judges that I know and respect and love, they're not the smartest necessarily. They're not legal scholars. Um, they just will listen. They'll let lawyers do their job. They'll let lawyers tell the judge what the law is. They don't come in with their mind already made up. The other thing that I've noticed about really great judges is they are respectful to everyone. They're respectful when citizens come in without an attorney. 
And even when they rule against them, you'll hear the people compliment them. You know, if that's your decision, Judge. You know, and I think that would be kind of my nature and kind of the philosophy I would have of being a judge is I want to give everybody the opportunity to, to say what needs to be said in court. I want to enforce the law as written. Um, you know, I don't want to judge anybody based on what they look like or who they are or where they're from. If you come in and you present evidence in the appropriate way, Time. I want to be able to listen to you, give you that respect, and make a decision. Uh, somebody's on the lights. Oops. <laughs> mark of maybe a voting machine going down uh, and we had to wait two hours for it to come back up. Johnny, so that's not a commentary on you. <laughs> we had to wait for that to happen. So things happen. We're going to proceed and uh, judicial philosophy and ethics. Attorney Travis. Thank you. Trustee Travis. So my judicial philosophy, I kind of spoke on it a little bit more um, being ethical, efficient, and engaging. Ethical, being honest, fair, unbiased. It's not personal. Being able to relate to the people in front of you and relate to those that are not represented as well. Um, efficient, being able to make sure we're finding the, the best way, the, the best resource. Efficient with our finances, efficient with our information. And engaging, being an active listener. Um, being able to interpret the law and read the law and rule on the law and look at the evidence. Um, so those are still things that I've used as an attorney, I will use as a judge, um, but I think that they're important to have, like someone said, a good temperament, being able to engage with others, um, being able to have conversations with different people, be respectful, um, and be pleasant and professional. Um, because I think that sometimes, you know, especially with probate court, um, it's going to uh, attack some of our most vulnerable clients. They're going through um, situations where there is some burdens. Um, someone's died or someone's happy. Um, so it's a time, thank you, it's a time when um, people are vulnerable and people need to be engaged or make sure that they have the, the most efficient way to resolve their problem and that that is ethical and that we are following the law. Um, so I believe that that is going to be my judicial philosophy that I follow as an attorney. Attorney um, Leo. Thank you. <clears throat> my judicial philosophy is, is summed up in the same by, by an unknown writer. Two men or women were seen peering through bars. One saw mud and the other saw stars. One looked up and saw the stars bedecked in the sky. The other looked down and saw the mud, muck, and the mire. They both were in jail. If I can make families who are broken, who come into probate court, instead of holding their heads down because they're upset about what happened with mama and they're not together, if I can help them see the stars after they're hearing, then I've done my job. All right, our next question. Case management and efficiency. Probate cases can often be lengthy and complex. What strategies would you implement to improve that efficiency of the probate court without compromising the quality of justice? And how would you manage your docket in a timely manner? Attorney McDonald. Thank you. Uh, one thing I would do first and uh, foremost, not everyone uses the electronic filing system here in Jefferson County, but I would encourage that because that means that the court is receiving those documents faster. Number two is I would require the attorneys to make sure that they're filing things that are correct um, and because that slows down the court. When the court has to hold hearings because an attorney did not do something properly, then that holds down and bogs up the, the system. Third, the thing I will do is, want, again, educate the citizens, educate the attorneys on what is statutorily required for the time periods within probate law. You have to wait six months. The court That's not on the court, right? That's written in, in stone without a legislator. And so we need to make sure that we understand the process. By understanding the process, paperwork can be filed correctly, right? We can not bog down the court with unnecessary filings. And if, the other thing that I would have is a motion day, a motion docket, where the parties come before the court and we are able to expedite hearings in a timely fashion and utilize Zoom as well. Attorney Blanchard, case management and efficiency. So we. 
Okay, so with efficiency and case management, I think the first thing I would do um, on the bench is look at cases that have been pending for a long time and try to get those cases out. Um, because you got inter individuals waiting on justice to be served. And I would also, and I'm, I'm a big, big fan of pro se day. So you have a lot of pro se litigants, and I'm gonna tell you guys what that means. People who are not represented, residents who are not represented by lawyers. And so a lot of times the dockets are clogged up because you have pro se clients or pro se um, residents coming in and they don't have the balance that they need filed. And so one way I would um, resolve that is to work with the Birmingham Bar, the Bessemer Bar, to see if we can get some pro bono attorneys in on a pro se day and help get these pro se um, litigants, um, residents, get their cases resolved. And that's one way um, that I can um, pretty much reduce the dockets and um, assist with efficiency in the court. Attorney Amari. One. I was telling you all about some of my favorite judges that I've seen. Um, one judge in particular, I don't know if she wants me to shout her name out tonight, but she was not a she was not a judge in the area that she went into. She wasn't a practicing lawyer there, um, but she had the what I consider a perfect temperament. She asked, she had a hearing or I had a meeting with all the lawyers that practice in that area. And she said, tell me the problems in this court. Tell me what y'all have been seeing over the years that you think should be better. And she just listened. And um, she took a lot of what was told to her to heart, made some changes. And, and I think the court runs a whole lot better now since she's been there than it did uh, before she was there. And I would probably take the same approach. I think the first thing I would do is bring these probate lawyers that are there day in and day out, the, the, the gurus and the most experienced ones. And I would say, hey, what are the problems that you're seeing? And uh, what can we do to fix it? And I think that would be a great starting point. Um, the other thing that I just see as a lawyer is sometimes cases just sit there. I mean, nobody does anything. And if the judge doesn't issue an order or ask the lawyers, hey, what's going on with this case? Do you need me? Why hasn't anybody closed this out yet? Um, nothing is ever going to be done. So I think the other thing I think I would do to help move the cases along is make sure we are watching the timeline of the cases and reaching out to these lawyers to figure out why things have gotten stuck. Attorney West, probate one. Technology and mediation. I worked 17 years in the technical field programming rocket systems and missile systems in Huntsville, Alabama. Our fi filing system is better than nothing, but we can improve. We can make it more efficient, more effective for lawyers and for citizens. So that's one thing I will look at is improving our filing system. Mediation, I will work to bring in more mediation, settlement dockets, mediators to help families resolve these problems when they don't understand. Have lawyers and mediators who understand probate law to come in and, and try to diffuse situations, uh, bring people in so that they can understand what we're going through uh, and, and how the process works in probate court. And that helps out a lot. Thank you. Attorney Travis, case management, efficiency, strategies without compromising the quality of justice. Thank you, trusted Travis. Um, so the first thing I would do is to promote our online filing that we do have a probate court. Um, one of the first things that I did when I became an attorney was to join the probate section of the bar. Um, I actually led that section and it's a chance for you to work with staff of probate court and other attorneys in the probate section. I think that just being able to engage demographics like um, some of my counterparts have said, other attorneys, <coughs> as well as those interested um, and have an interest in probate court like the staff, um, that is a good way to understand what are the complexities and challenges that you may run into when you're practicing in probate. Every year the probate section does a CLE on the first Friday of December and they invite both of the probate judges and two of them come and talk about all of the, the trends in probate court. So making sure that we're promoting that more, making sure people are engaged, lawyers are engaged, um, as well as um, the idea about mediation. I think that that's a wonderful tool that could help a lot of the cases that come through probate court. Um, and just the communication. So of course, case management helps things be more efficient. Um, I believe that just more communication and engagement with more probate lawyers, knowing who each other um, is among that group. One of the things as a probate section um, chair, I started our email, listserv. 
so that probate lawyers can communicate around one another around probate issues. And so continuing to do things like that is what I'm passionate about to make sure we have efficiency within probate court, as well as we understand what's the best practice for case management. Remember to trust in Travis. All right. Um, attorney Moore, probate two. Thank you. So I, by working in the city court, you know, we have dockets that have 136 people. I walk in and I see a list. And when I get that list, I have to make sure that I'm prepared. The first thing you want to know about me is that I'm going to start court on time. That's how you get your docket and that's how you improve efficiency, being timely being responsible to everybody for their time. Everybody is important. I've already told you before that I do want to have a mediation day. I want to have mediators available for uh, individuals who may need that so that we can move those cases. The, again, you can go into probate court now and you may see a list of about 30 people on the docket for today. Sometimes the, the attorneys will file a motion to continue at the last moment. What you do want to have is a the, risk, the attorneys knowing that that may not be as favorable for them as uh, if you have that as a judge and then you know that that judge is going to hold you accountable for making sure that your clients are represented and that you come to court in a timely manner and prepared to move forward with the cases. Attorney Motor. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, first, I'll say, as a Birmingham Municipal Judge, I helped transition the City of Birmingham Municipal Court from paper dockets to paperless. So that was one of the most exciting opportunities. So that's one of the things that's more efficient now. We don't have to write on uh, 10 different files. Uh, but I agree, um, uh, y'all. if y'all know any Morehouse men, we have a saying, to be on time is to be late, and to be late is unacceptable. So not only do you need to be on time, you need to be early. <laughs> And that's going to set the tone because the one thing I found in municipal court, the one thing that people value the most is their time. They don't want you to waste their time. They don't want you chit-chatting. They don't want no speech. They want you to get them in and out of that court as fast as possible. And if you do that, everything else will follow. And attorney blanket chip. What everybody else said. No, seriously, those, those, are, those are wonderful answers. Um, it's hard going last because everybody gets all the good points out already. Mediation is a, is a must. We have to have mediation in this court, but technology is an even bigger must, especially as we continue to move down the road. Now, the problem is it's going to be expensive, but we have one technology for recording. We have a different one for judicial, and both of them are in the Stone Age. We need to do better. We need to look at better systems and create better things. Additionally, we need to make it more user-friendly for the public. No one's excited in coming in here. The one thing I, I will slightly disagree with is you have to be there, you have to be on time. I think that's important, you get up, you get going. But it, it's kind of it's, it's kind of like when you go to that fast food restaurant you've never been to before and you're looking at the menu and you're like, why is everybody taking so long? And then you get up there and you're having to choose. It's because you want to be heard and you want to make sure you're making the right choice. These are important decisions that are being made in these courts. These commitments, these guardianships, these conservatorships are important. We have to make sure that we are giving people every opportunity to show their case, to prove their case, because real decisions are being made that, that we can't be flippant about, and we have to make sure that justice is being done. Thank you. We're going into the speed round, round number two. You have 60 seconds. Okay. <laughs> it is approximately 6.53. This warm ends at 7.30, and we do want our <laughs> illustrious audience to get those great questions in. Here we go. First up, Attorney West, innovation and improvement. How would you address the issue of accessibility in our courts and financial resources? Take either one. The probate judge, every filing that happens in probate court, $11 is charged for filings. So I would use that money to try to improve uh, our technical resources uh, in probate court. Uh, and just make sure there's accessibility for lawyers as well as citizens and make sure they understand how to use our systems. Attorney Amari? Yes, not a problem. How would you, innovation and improvement, how would you address the issue of accessibility in the probate court for all citizens, especially those with limited financial resources? No money. <laughs> 
You know, when you're when you're using the taxpayer's money, it's 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 wonderful to talk, tell everybody all the things you're going to do, right? But there's only so much amount of money. And I think there's two things that I bring to the table that I would try to do. And I think one of them is lobbying the legislature. I mean, you've got to get money from somewhere and hoping that, you know, filing fees and all that will add up enough to be enough. I just don't know that that is going to be enough. So I don't want to hear, sit here and tell you all something and promise something that the county won't be able to afford. But I do think that was something I could play a role in, is the legislature trying to get more money brought into the Jefferson County Probate Court. With whatever money you have, you have to maximize it. One way to make things accessible to the public is to, like I talked about earlier, train your staff to help people, to be inviting and to want to help, and talk people and tell them some things they can do on their own so they don't feel like they're blocked out of court by money. Attorney Moore. Thank you. What I would do, and first thing we have to do is know what the budget is, and if each of us uh, get a copy of the county budget, it is available, it is open to the public. Probate court has a significant budget, and just so that you, everyone knows, Alicord is a system that the judges that we use currently, and the probate court is actually on its way to using Alicord, which is an extremely, it's better technology than what we have right now. But accessibility for probate court, uh, I would look at putting a computer out because in some courts you have some computers that are out user friendly for the public so that the public can come in and use those computers. We do have some downstairs currently that you do research and searches on but I would like to put one on the upstairs level so individuals can look onto the file and get some of the information that they need prior to court. Attorney Travis, probate one. Thank you, Trustee Travis. Um, I think when we're talking about accessibility, there are some physical um, accessibility issues. There are some physical and financial accessibility issues. Everyone can't access the probate court. Um, those that might be handicapped or have mobility issues. So I think we need to look at the demographic that we serve and make sure that we're accessible to all of those people um, that will be actually handling business at probate court. I think that trying to improve probate court will definitely be done because we won't always get better. I don't think I will know what's going to be best until I become your candidate and your judge for Jefferson County Probate Court. But I do think it's important to work with organizations like Alpha Kappa Alpha and Delta Sigma that is Royalty Incorporated to make sure they understand the processes and that there are resources developed to hand out to members in the community about probate court, what happens, what could happen, and how it can be accessible to all. Attorney Blankenship, probate two. Accessibility starts with education and communication. You have to let the public understand what happens in this court, what you can and cannot do, and how they operate with it. From a funding standpoint, Johnny's right, you need to go to the, the legislature, but in addition to that, as commission, former Commissioner Smoot will, will tell you, the county commission has a great deal of authority, and when those special funds come in, like COVID funds, like other funds, you need to have a judge up there fighting to make sure that's appropriated to the, the probate court. One of the great tools there is running elections in which we are going to be able to get federal election money and hopefully more money from the state. And you need to focus on where you can get the special money from to bring it in and make sure that it's applied correctly to the court as needed. Attorney Logan. Thanks. <clears throat> Do you know that the actual trend in estate planning is really for you to get your assets to whoever you want before they pass? The best thing we can do for accessibility is when you do your next training with attorneys and estate planning, have those lawyers talk to the families about mama about going ahead and giving the car to whoever you want to have it, giving the house to whoever you want to have it before they get sick and Medicaid gets involved. And if you do that, the trend is really to keep people from having to go to probate court and keep them have, from having to pay $3,500 to $5,000 just so you can get mama's house and car. All right, we're going to switch it up. Probate court also deals with the elections. Oh, I apologize. Ms. Yes, ma'am. Attorney Blanchard. Thank you. Um, I would say accessibility, in my opinion, with probate court would start, would start with having um, adequate technology and computers in probate court so everybody can pull up out for it. Um, that's the way that you can keep up with cases. And a lot of courts, a clerk, the clerk's office, I want to say on the fourth or the fifth floor, has it where you can get on the computer and look up your case. 
Um, but that being said, that will make it better for the public to come in and check on their records um, in regards to seeing what's been filed, what's sent out. A lot of times they mail out orders for court dates, but I think that when the public knows that they can come into the courthouse and assess the computer and find out what's going on with their case, that makes everything more efficient, in my opinion. Um, the next thing I would say is using third-party resources. In regards to saving money, five seconds, um, I would say we still need to um, hone in on um, pro bono attorneys to help out with those issues as well. Thank you. Thank you. Attorney McDonald. Thank you. Um, we've heard a lot about filing fees. Just to make sure you understand, every court charges filing fees, so it's not special about probate court. Probate court isn't um, just taking everybody else's money. In civil court, you're filing, people are having to pay filing fees for that as well. The probate court gets its budget from the recording deeds and as well as the judicial filings. Its budget is about $7.3 million that is utilized from that court already. The access for ordinary citizens, what I would do is to allow them to utilize technology such as Zoom so that they can have hearings and not have to travel down to the court, but be able to dial in from their own phone to be able to talk with the court about their issues uh, when there's a motion day or a hearing day. And that helps people understand, one, that we value their time and that they can call in while they're at their job, take a break, get in their car, and be able to assess the court. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to switch it up a little bit. In business, the probate courts, as you can now see here, has a lot of money. A lot of money for you lawyers out there for business purposes. And uh, there have been times, and I know this because I was a former county commissioner for eight years, uh, the budgets are large. And um, uh, sometimes the people that are there have been there since 1871. Kidding, but you know what I mean. So my question to all of you is this, as we switch it up, you got one minute. Um, how are you going to share the resources with other firms and lawyers and citizens, such as conservatorships, uh, such as business and in the probate court. Do you have a plan of action for that? You have 60 seconds. Let's start with Mr. Blankenship. So to, to clarify the question, it, there are various things that occur in this court in which fees are paid out to attorneys. And, and, and the question is, how are you going to allocate that? And the answer is very simply, it's going to be allocated equally to the best people that are in that court. If you're practicing in that court, if you're there on a regular basis, there's gonna be a rotating list that is allocated equally without any type of, uh, 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 any type of, of discrepancy, without any type of anything. If you're on the list, you're gonna get picked from the list and you're gonna get the case. Very simple, that's how it needs to be arranged. Equal for everyone, no special treatment for anyone, regardless of how high up your office is in the sky. Uh, attorney uh, Loder? Two things that make for um, the greatest opportunity for lawyers to participate in the business of probate court. The first is transparency. Uh, nine times out of ten, lawyers don't know how to get appointed as a guardian ad litem or how to get appointed. So we need to have a transparent system where everybody knows how they can participate in the system. Uh, and then second, uh, there has to be competition. You gotta make folks compete. Nobody should be entitled to work for probate court. If you make them compete, you're gonna get the best qualified people to participate in helping the probate court accomplish its goals. <clears throat> Attorney Moore. So in, in the probate court in place to, you do get to appoint guardian ad litems, administrative ad litems, individuals that would help to uh, get cases through if needed. My, my philosophy is that my door will be open to for the attorneys to sign that they are willing to take on these particular cases. I will be clear, probate court has very complicated probate cases. I'm gonna say it one more time. Probate court has very complicated probate cases. It would not be judicially wise to appoint a one-year attorney to a case that is extremely complex. That would not be fair to that attorney. That would not be fair to those individuals that are uh, litigating that case. 
So I will be clear that I will be looking at the type of case it is. If it's very extremely complex, I'm looking to find a seasoned attorney to assist so that we can make sure that these individuals are represented and if there is someone who does not have the competency. Time. Sorry. <laughs> Next, uh, uh, Attorney Travis. Thank you, Trusted Travis. Um, so I think that um, everyone's made some great points today, but I think what's important is being able to use the resources that we have. I think um, sharing the resources about knowing who's out there, and it should be equal. I think one of the best things that we have to do as attorneys is to be able to be engaged in the Bar Association and the Alabama Lawyers and the um, Birmingham Women's Lawyers Association with different organizations to know the attorneys that are out there um, and know the attorneys that are practicing probate work so you actually understand the level of of complex cases that they may be able to do. Thank you. Um, so I think that that's very important, being able to be engaged and involved um, and be able to learn and teach others. I serve as the president of the Birmingham School of Law Foundation, where I try to engage with attorneys because, uh, I'm sorry, law students as they become attorneys because usually you're gonna help them along their path to greatness. And so even starting with law students to understand probate court and nurturing them, being able to um, work with law students as well as um, Big firms and time. those that have been lawyers for a long time are very important. Uh, Attorney West. Probate court revenue, seven to eight million dollars a year, more than any other government entity in Jefferson County, more than the DA, more than any government entity. We never had a black probate judge in place one, elected, place two, elected. Never had a black county administrator, not had a black county conservator, that will change. There are some black attorneys that have been practicing for years that should be able to get some of these appointments. I'm going to appoint some white lawyers, but I'm going to appoint some black lawyers. Probate court will look like Jefferson County. Mr. Amari, Attorney Amari. Well, what a great thing for me to follow there. It is hard to last because these lawyers made great points. Um, I've been appointed. I've been appointed as a GAL. I've been appointed um, on these kind of cases. And I've developed a reputation of being somebody, uh, whether this is good or bad, that has the personality that I can deal with the hardest people to deal with. And I tend to get appointed to represent people that... I'm the third, fourth, fifth lawyer. I think that's where the judge learns the lawyers that practice in their courtroom and can start making decisions about where somebody might be a fit or not. Um, I do want to say this. I can't do anything about being the first black probate judge in Jefferson County. Um, I truly believe in someone's merits that deserves anything they get. I don't care what somebody looks like. I don't, I don't care what someone's preferences are all I care about is are you a good are you good at your job and are you going to be honest and are you going to be ethical and are you going to do a good job that's all I care about so in my administration there will be white judges black judges purples you know, everyone will get opportunities to get at your job moving on attorney Blanchard thank you attorney <laughs> this is a good question and I'm going to tell you this I will not be the cherry picking judge I will give white firm cases, I'm gonna give solo black firm cases. Because historically, and you know a lot of people won't face up to it and say it, it has not been done that way. So any appointments that will come under my judgeship is gonna be done equally. That means you're a small solo firm, black African American firm owner will have appointed cases just like your large white firms have cases, the large black firms. And so I'm gonna spread it out evenly and I'm gonna make sure that I'm fair with that. Attorney McDonald. Thank you. One thing I wanna explain is what the conservatorship and guardianship is, right? The conservatorship is a person that is put in place to oversee someone else's money, right? So that person has to be ethical. We just can't put anybody in that place because you want that person to be responsible for your money and at the end of the day, bring your money to court, not steal your money, right? So we just can't put any and everybody in that position. Now, that person also has to be bonded. So they have to be credit worthy. Again, that's going to exclude some people. 
I've been appointed by courts for different conservatorships, and I have to go get a bond, right? And that's required by law for everybody else that's appointed to. So what I would do is evaluate the candidates that want to be considered for conservatorship, make sure that they want to serve in that position because that can be a thankless position, right? Not appreciated. And I want to make sure that they're ethical and trustworthy because that means the court is vouching for them and putting them in place over somebody else's money. Thank you. I did want to clarify about the business of probate. I'm going to let Attorney West uh, do that really quick because there are citizens that can be also appointed without having a legal background. Can you explain that really quick? Right. Uh, you got 30 seconds. Right. Sometimes family members can be conservators over other family members' estate. All right? But when it comes to the county appointing a conservator, you have to be an attorney and the, and the judge in place one with a point that are those attorneys. So far, they've all been white. Thank you. I, there are some black qualified lawyers that can that can handle these positions. I say that because when I was there as a county commissioner, uh, the <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, the uh, it, anyway, there were no there were no blacks appointed. And there were no women appointed, and there were uh, three uh, county attorneys and. Um, Anyway, that is why that question was asked. The business of courts, there is lots of money that comes through these courts. So there is business there, and sometimes on some of these cases, you do not have to be a legal mind to be involved. And I did want some of them to clarify that, and that's why that question of the business of the probate was asked. Let's go to elections. Your probate court also controls the elections. Uh, this probate judge also has an appointee. Uh, there's a Bessemer division. So I'm going to do a kamikaze of you all and going to ask you all to tell me what your